everyone. We're going to just wait a minute while we get everybody to join, but we'll get started soon. Okay, hello. Thank you for attending today. I'm Scott Sinclair. I'm the Senior Manager of Programs here at Enhancing Careers, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items related to accreditation. Now, today's webinar is accredited by ANCC, ASWB, the New York State Education Department State Board of Social Work, the California Board of Registrars, Society for Plan on requesting educational credits for, for this program from any of these accrediting bodies, please follow the following steps. First, you must log in individually. Participants who listen in on someone else's line will not receive credit. Second, you must complete and submit the evaluation and post test, as well as receive a passing grade of 80% or higher on the post test. Following today's session, you'll receive an email with all of this information. The follow-up the follow email will be sent no later than 5 p.m. tomorrow on Thursday, August 4th, and certificates will be emailed within four weeks. Please also note that the presenters and planners of this program have not disclosed any pertinent financial relationships or conflicts of interest, and that no commercial support was provided for this program. Uh, but thanks in part to direct support from Genentech, HSN, and QVC, Cancer Careers is able to offer this eighth year of the Balancing Work and Cancer webinar series. This program was created to provide patients and survivors, as well as their care teams and employers, with concise, targeted information about the work-related issues that arise after a cancer diagnosis. Additionally, we'd like to thank Cancer Careers' year-long sponsors who support all of our core programs and allow us to continue providing all resources Now, as we know, transitions in life are ine inevitable and can be intentional or unexpected. Either way, they can offer new opportunities for learning, growth, reinvention, especially now in this rapidly evolving environment. Talk us through how to approach this incredibly important process. I'm happy to introduce Kathy Flora, a nationally certified career counselor, master certified coach, and author. Kathy is an executive coach who has held the senior leadership roles in both the public and private sector. And she's been a part of Cancer and Careers for a very long time. In fact, Kathy was the inspiration for our career coaching services. At the end of the webinar, there'll be a question and answer period. Any questions that you would like answered should be in the Q&A box or at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just so for our own uh, peace of mind, please don't ask the questions for Kathy in the chat box that they might not be seen. If you're joining us via phone today, you can press star nine, which will alert us of your question. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Kathy to get us started. Thank you, Scott. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad you are all here. Um, I wanna thank the whole CAC team for inviting me to talk about a subject that we have all been dealing with this past few years, transitions. And specifically, we're talking about positive work transitions and how you can manage through this current environment to create a positive work transition using strategies that look ahead to create what's next for you, however you want to envision it. Now, up until around February 1st of 2020, I would say that life and work transitions are inevitable and they happen to all of us. And that those of us who are cancer survivors or patients have learned to develop a resiliency through our common cancer experience. And that prepared us to handle just about anything else that life throws our way. That resiliency especially is really essential. And we were ready for anything, right? That is until, next slide please, Scott that unexpected once in a century, huge disruptive transition that happened. And from the first one, which was the pandemic, came cascading a series of transitions, one after the other, after the other. Next slide, please. And those transitions seem only to accelerate. Sometimes I kind of wonder if we're experiencing what was akin to what happened in the late Middle Ages into the Renaissance period, 
in which knowledge exploded all over the place? Or maybe the industrial revolution in which work life changed forever across the whole globe. Right now, and I think probably all of you on the call, whether you're a medical practitioner or social worker or HR person or someone who is going through um, revive, re, you know, resetting after a cancer diagnosis, we're all facing conflicting situations in the employment world where the, there are skill shortages and jobs are going empty, but at the same time, we see something that the experts are calling the great resignation. I'm sure you've heard that term before. And some people are leaving their jobs because they can, because they've got the skills and other people are going after them, but other people are finding it difficult to get interviews, let alone the job of their dreams. So unfortunately, right now, there is this situation in the employment world where structural changes in employment are coupled with inflation, especially on housing. It used to be on gas, although here in Florida, it's gone down to 389 a gallon. You guys out West can look at me and smile. We even have shortage of goods, right? There's a picture of when the formula shortage happened. It seems that there's a lot we have to adapt to today. And so I want to focus this webinar with a message of both resiliency that I mentioned and hope for your future. And we're going to talk about some distinct tools you can use to make this environment that we're all in work better for you. For as you can see, and anybody who's lived through the last two and a half years can tell you, we are indeed resilient experts in transition. Next slide, please. And we're all in this together. This is a state of recalibration. We have a common need to look at our assumptions. What we used to know as true doesn't necessarily hold true anymore. I find that when I look at the employment world, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, what has happened? And we all have to learn new strategies for coping in the world that we know is evolving faster and faster than we ever thought possible or imagined. The work world before the pandemic was already undergoing a rapid change. You may have heard the term, the fourth industrial revolution. That was the, like the internet of things where people needed to understand and know that things were gonna be driven by AI and uh, some of the other rapid technological changes that are happening. And now changes in work and everyday life are accelerating even more so. I think we wonder, are we gonna recognize the world of work when this is all over? And I propose that the main question really is how can you capitalize on your strengths and the resiliency that you have learned and I mentioned to navigate and create a spot for yourself in this new world that really fits for you. So in the next couple of minutes, we're gonna focus on just that. Could I have the next slide please? So here we go. In this afternoon, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna examine the evolving transition models. People have been talking about transition for a long time in the psychological world and in the business world. And there are experts in psychology and neurobiology and business that we can use to understand how to navigate in our own work life. I'm also going to share a concise strategy that you can use to apply to your own work pivot points. I call pivot point that point in your life where all of a sudden everything is different and you go, oh, what happened to me? So we want to make sure that you can future proof yourself and your career in the face of this exponential change that we're talking about. Let's go on to the next slide. And we're going to start with one of the foundational concepts by a psychological master you've probably all heard of, Eric Erickson. And Eric's, Erickson talked about the identity life cycle, and he talks about it as being at different stages of life. You have a choice between um, something that really works or something that's dysfunctional. And that as you go through the external changes of growth in your life, from infancy all the way to old age, that external change is pressing down around us, but we're also changing on the inside. So 
these changes in that personal identity, they can be really exciting. You know, the kid who learns how to play soccer all of a sudden feels like a pro. Um, the adult who gets their first job may be a little bit scared. Sometimes those changes have a big dose of scary thrown in, even though they're exciting. So no matter how many times we're gonna encounter these passages and people have called these passages too, if we're not prepared and not understand that they're normal, they can throw us for a loop. So we want all of you to have a plan in order to navigate them well. Let's go to the next slide. In line with Eric and Erickson's thinking, the, the way that a lot of us have thought about the world of work is that the main job of adolescents and young people is to figure out their work identity. Then once they figure out what they wanna be when they grow up, they launch into the world and they're set for life, right? Well, we all know now that that doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. Maybe it used to, maybe you could go out and join a guild and become a leather smith or a blacksmith or something. But nowadays, mm -mm. people change jobs a lot. And the average person who is now in kindergarten will be doing jobs that uh, you've heard this before that don't even exist today. So more recent research that has delved into work identity doesn't say that you're gonna find your ideal work and your ideal work identity once in your life. It says that there will be different times in your life driven by different kinds of events, whether it's a change or a passage from say middle age to old age or from early adulthood to mid adulthood, or it can be something that causes a cycle to shift. Um, and that cycle of shift could be your cancer diagnosis. So it usually starts where you're in a position where you're trying to determine your, what's really authentic and what's the, uh, you know, the real strong positive version of yourself in this work. And then you get plugged in and then you have work achievement in which you settle into that job and you do really well. But then maybe you're bored with it or maybe you get that cancer diagnosis or maybe there was a pandemic and all of a sudden you lost your job. I don't know but that can cause you to rethink what matters to you. And it can cause you to change and shift and go back into what we call the work moratorium. And what it is, is a good thing because it causes you to kind of continue to seek your best fit. And it's a normal and healthy response to change. If you understand how you're naturally wired to react to these kinds of transitions this way, then you can navigate them much more effectively. So let's go on to the next slide. And I wanna to talk to you about two guys, William Bridges and John Cotter. And they were back in the eighties and nineties talking about a transition model. This one that you see up there is the William Bridges model. I used to talk about this model all the time when I was doing what was called outplacement work when I lived back in Boston. And um, you may have heard of it. And then John Cotter had eight step model for transitions in organizations. If you've been involved in any organizational change efforts, you may have also been familiar with Cotter's work. The basic premise of both of them is that in any transition, you're gonna go through a phase of letting go. And then you have to make that leap into the unknown, that kind of scary period of time where you're not really sure where you're going. That I call the neutral zone. And then eventually you're ready to um, engage and go into the new beginning. Life smooths out until the next transition. It looks benign. It looks kind of like a wave. I know all about that living down here in Florida. But guess what? It's not calm and soothing. Mm -mm, not at all. What you can experience in a transition of a job loss or a difficult diagnosis or any big change in your life and work is um, challenging. And it may not be what your head and heart are telling you that you want to go through in your own transition. Um, next slide, please. These are the kinds of emotions that uh, Bridges talks about um, in a person going through change. And actually, Cotter says organizations actually have predictable emotions that individuals are going to go through too. And it makes sense that you're gonna feel 
some sort of elation or I would call it getting let out of the box feeling when you when you first have an ending it's like oh yay and then you get a little nervous and you go through a period of reassessing and then you feel excited to go on again um, and knowing about this the fact that the emotions are going to be sort of a roller coaster can help you feel a little bit more comfortable inside about what you see and um, Realistically, though, this is not as smooth even as it looks here. Let's go on to the next slide, Scott. It feels more like that. It feels like, oh my gosh, what did I go through? Oh, I don't want to look at it. Oh my goodness, what did I do? Oh, I hate this. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh no, I can't do this. There's all kinds, all kinds of emotions and feelings and reactions that can go on. And it's not necessarily comforting to think about transition that way. Let's go on to the next slide. The good news, I think, is that more recently, we've had psychologists and psychiatrists and neurosciences and career change experts that really have worked to get a more nuanced perspective of what happens inside of us as we go through transition. So with this more thorough knowledge base, we can apply that to our own situations today. What you've got here are three out of thousands of books that talk about the power and the agility of our brains and of our spirit and our mind and our ability to draw on that resilience and figure out how we can navigate effectively. The body of knowledge about how our brains on change is growing so much. It's vast. But I'm going to just share a little bit of it to you. Um, some of the recent discoveries, and then also some ancient wisdom that's held in that book, The Aiki Guy, which is a, a, an Asian perspective that we'll talk about too. Because I want you to be able to arrive at a more potent understanding of how you can really thrive in your transition period that you're in the midst of right now. Let's go to the next slide. So this is our brains on change. And there's a couple of real strong experts that I did some research on and found out that there's some theories that all kind of mold together. The first one is a gentleman from my old alma mater at Michigan State University. His name is Dr. Saranopoulos. And he said in his studies, he found that no matter what kind of change you're going through, even if it's, oh my goodness, you're gonna get married to the love of your life, or oh my goodness, you just landed the job of your dreams, or oh my goodness, you're just gonna have that baby, or oh my goodness, you're moving into a brand new house, it's still threatening to your brain, even if it's positive, let alone if it's a negative change. So you might experience some anxiety around that change because it's a step outside your comfort zone. And you all know people who don't ever even want to throw something away. Well, it's that, it's threatening because something different just registers different in their brain. And then one of my favorite guys, Dr. Sereni Pillay of Harvard Medical School, Using his strategies, I actually was able to go on a zip line and climb a telephone pole because he taught me how, I didn't talk to him personally, I read his book. He taught me how to talk to myself in the first person to overcome my fear of change. Powerful, powerful stuff. So he says that any change that you go through generates emotional energy or what he calls a charge. And you can take that charge and harness it and use it in a positive way. But the cost of switching from what you're doing now into the new thing has to be worth it to you. In other words, you have to weigh it carefully and look at your value structure and make a decision that it's what you want to do. It's very useful for things like losing weight or making a career change. So you might want to take a look at his book called Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try. Loved it. Then there's a Polish psychologist, psychiatrist. And um, his is, it's really close to my heart 
he says, in order to reach a higher level of self, you have to do something called positive dissolution. Dissolution. In other words, you have to dissolve your old self in order to become your new self. And that dissolution fuels a dynamism that propels us forward. If you can imagine that, that period where you're dissolving can be really, really nerve wracking. In other words, if I were to be honest with you, my cancer diagnosis wiped out a whole lot of what I believed about my body and myself and how I was to work in the world. And I had to recreate that. I think I came out of it more gentle and more forgiving and also more determined to do something that I really liked. Um, I think a lot of us go through that. At least that's my experience in working with a lot of, a lot of folks um, on the career coaching side of cancer and careers. But you know, in simple terms, what we're talking about really is an internal circle being your comfort zone and that the neuroscientists say that all growth comes when you step outside that comfort zone. You step outside that blue circle. In order to grow, you have to give up your safety, the things that are familiar, the things that are routine. And when you go through a cancer diagnosis, you have to give up a whole lot of stuff about what you thought of the world before. But the good news is, is that progress occurs outside the circle. If you allow yourself to stretch, if you step out and you try some new stuff, and if you envision where you wanna go and you work to make that happen, it doesn't just happen because it's easy to fall back into the past. It's so easy to. So you need to be conscious about it and to consciously say to yourself, okay, I'm in a transition. My brain is reacting this way. It's okay to be nervous. I'm going to try this anyway. And that's what we're going to talk about. So I want to ask you if you remember or have ever heard about how in Native American cultures and Eastern cultures, ancient mystics used to speak about the value of the wilderness experience. Any of you ever gone on one of those, you know what I'm talking about, a vision quest or a wilderness experience. That's where you have to go out into the wild unknown by yourself usually. And it's in that process of identity between one identity and the next. I think of the Native American cultures where um, the young man would go out into the, into the wilderness and come back a, um, a fully engaged adult. And a lot of cultures put their people through that. It's precisely though that that happens out there when you're becoming the unfocused in-between stage where all that personal growth happens. The leap isn't gonna be free of emotion. It might be uncomfortable, but if you can roll with the emotion and harness it, you're gonna see that your circle, your comfort zone expands and encompasses the new you. So it's a cycle of disillusion and regeneration. It's natural in all life and it occurs in the natural world. Now, you know, I'm still talking about jobs and careers, but what I'm talking about is the internal stuff that goes on when you're faced with recreating who you are after a big change, like we've all been through with this world of work or you have been through with your cancer diagnosis. So we're gonna go on to the next slide. And I want you to look at a familiar example. And we all have a picture of a caterpillar weaving the cocoon, right? I have a girlfriend who raises monarch butterflies. I know that sounds crazy. She, buy, she gets milkweed seeds and she plants them and then the monarchs come and create their chrysalises in her backyard. And she watches them. And you can see those caterpillars weaving a cocoon. And what happens is they rest in the brownish greenish shell, shell for a couple of days or weeks, and then they crack it open and that caterpillar has become this marvelous butterfly. Just like that, right? Mm -mm. Nope, that's not how it happens. 
it's not really very appetizing, but it's really amazing. And if you've had a chance to, and I would encourage you to do this, somebody on YouTube did some time-lapse photography of what happens inside of a chrysalis. And it's messy and it's unappetizing and it is miraculous. So go watch it yourself. So here's what happens. The caterpillar sheds its skin and it leaves a chrysalis. It, it wiggles and squirms out of its skin to make this chrysalis. And then it whirls around on this little thread that it's attached to a, um, to a branch usually. And eventually the skin and the bugs seem to disappear inside this rubbery shell. And if you look inside the cocoon early in the process, it's kind of icky, gloppy stuff. I call it gross bug glop. But in that glop, there are cells that contain the DNA coded instructions for turning that bug goo into a delicate winged creature. That is coded for transformation. It has a code for transformation, but it can't become all it's intended to be until it dissolves into that glob and does that internal work that's necessary. And once it does and the transformation is complete, it lets the sun and the wind dry its wings and then that beautiful creature flits away. And we're kind of like that in transitions. If we hit a life's pivot point in life or at work, sometimes it feels like we're that ball of glop. I know I felt like that when I lost my job at, during that cancer treatment. But you know what? What kind of a mystery lies within and what kind of magnificence are you coded to become if you stay resilient in the face of that transformation? Because, and this is a phrase you've heard many times, I really believe it to be true. We are here. We were made for times such as this. So let's go on to the next slide. So what's our status now? <laughs> We've all been forced in some kind of work moratorium, right? None of us are working the way we used to work before 2020, none of us. And what will be the future? We don't know. You could be just in the throes of a work change or maybe just trying to get used to a new environment just because of all the things that are happening in structural employment world. Or you could be just trying to get used to a cancer diagnosis. But for each and every one of us, you have to put that pandemic experience and the tectonic plate disruptions into the world of work on top of that. And they've all sent us into a place of uncertainty. It's kind of obvious to me that we need some strategies for how to work our way through this. You have to be able to navigate the change. So we're going to take everything that I've just talked about, and what the brain experts have told us, and what they recommend to apply it to our work transitions, and we're going to figure it out together, okay? So next slide. The best way forward that I know of is to embrace the change and what's new, including all the feelings that come out of it. And when you sense you're entering into the new phase of work, you really got to try some of those things. Enter what I call the pivot point flow. Step into your own cycle of discovery, your own chrysalis, if you will, and create that future that you envision. You gotta go one step at a time. So next slide, please, Scott. Here's some steps. The first step is pause. Pause, yeah, don't be frantic. Don't go running around. Sereni Pillay says that your mind does the best work in times of quiet, times of self-reflection. So pause, build some quiet time into your life to look inward with no pressures and no decisions required, and just take a breath. The calm will harness the power of your unfocused mind. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm stuck on a problem 
sometimes I will tell my brain to figure it out overnight. And there are times when I actually dream the answer. It's really exciting. This is where your creative brain can kick in for you. So you're, when you're sleeping or if you're meditating or if you're just sitting on the beach calm or sitting on your porch calm or walking in the park, your brain is actually doing the work that you ask it to do while you're in that pause. I actually do my best creative pondering um, on my bike rides in the morning. I take my bike out, I put on my helmet, I'm gonna go on a 10 mile ride. I breathe this tropical air that's been a little tough to breathe lately because it's been too hot. And I talk to myself. I let my mind wander. I kind of look at the road. I watch the trees. And sometimes I come up with some really cool stuff that I can come back and take action on because I took some time out to just allow my brain to be disengaged from worry and from planning. And I just pondered. So I'm going to ask you, and this is a rhetorical question, I know, because we can't interact and I wish we could, but do you have any specific ways that you give yourself a break, that you disconnect, that you pause, that you give yourself time without pressure to act or without pressure to make a decision? What are some of the ways that you use to quiet your own mind that actually work for you? because that's the first step into managing your transition. So what's next? Let's go on to the next slide and see. Next is you got a plan, but because you've had time to think about it, you're gonna plan with a purpose in mind, okay? So imagine if it would be so exciting if you could take all that you've thought about and all that you've come to the conclusion that you care about and actually put it into action and find a way to set in motion a series of actions that bring you closer to your ideal life. This can happen both in the work world and in your private life that, you know, maybe your hobbies or whatever. Like just before this webinar, I sat down and I got a notice about an art show that's coming up and they're taking, um, they're taking uh, exhibits from artists in my community. I decided I wanna be one. So I'm gonna take some of my best paintings and I've decided I'm going to submit them to the jury and see if I can be in the art show. Well, never done that before. I started learning to paint two years ago, but guess what? It matters to me. So I've put it into action and I'm gonna step closer to that ideal life. Now, what it takes is all that self-knowledge from your reflection and you need to find your sweet spot or the patterns in the answers that you get as you reflect. The Japanese call that sweet spot your Aikigai. Hopefully you've heard about an Aikigai before. It means the meaning of life. Think of it as your purpose, okay? It's the intersection of your passion, your mission, your vocation, your profession, what you're good at, what you love to do, what the world needs, and also what you can be paid to do. Because most of us, can't work for free. So if you return to the core or your Aikigai, it requires you to draw on a bunch of things, your past experience, your values. You gotta remind yourself of when you felt most alive and in the zone. You know, when did you work where it didn't feel like work where you're playing and um, where you found the most satisfaction and meaning in the things that you were doing in your life. Those that studied the blue zones on earth, have you ever heard of blue zones? There's a whole book on it. It's really cool. It's where people live the longest. And Okinawa is that place in particular that they found that those who live the longest in Okinawa live by Aikigai. And they had really long and really happy lives. So it's worth finding out what your Aikigai is or as close to it as you possibly can. Let's go on to the next slide and let's talk a little bit more about that because I think it's real important. As I coached people in cancer careers or, or in some of the coaching practice that I've had in my past, um, I frequently am asked the question, how can I find something to do that reflects my new values? 
especially find this when people are coming out of a cancer experience. I am living in my new normal. I don't want to do what I did before. How can I plan to go forward? And really, if you put it in the terms of Aikigai, what they're asking is, what's my Aikigai and how can I achieve it? And here's what I usually tell them. And it applies to anyone who is encountering a professional pivot point, whether you're off work, changing careers, in a career that no longer feels right for you, feeling like you need to grow. Take a look first at your accomplishments and what you've done that makes you feel successful. Then take a look at how you've been spending your time and determine if that activity gets you closer to expressing your core values and beliefs. Well, you gotta figure out what your core values and beliefs are first, don't you? Then look at what skills you have. Because I always tell people, cancer doesn't take away your skills. You have those in a bank that stays with you your whole life. But then take those skills and think about them and figure out which ones of those bring you joy. Determine where and how you want to make a difference in the world. The Aikigai matters. It, it matters that you make a difference in the world because we're not individuals on an island. Then you got to figure out if you have to say no to some things in order to leave room for the yeses that are going to come. But you can't stop there. Let's go to the next slide. After you make your plan and you figured some of this stuff out, and this is gonna require you to do some writing, maybe some posting in a journal, maybe just some talking to yourself into a tape, I don't care, but capture this stuff. Don't just think it in your head, write it down. And it's important for you to think about how you're gonna position yourself for impact because we're human beings and we care about making a difference in our world. So take a little bit of time every day to answer a couple of questions. Number one, what makes you stand out? What's your value add that you bring to the table? What do you care about the most? What are your work-related values? Do you care more about serving people? Do you care more about solving problems? Do you care more about crunching numbers? What, how are you wired? What's important to you in your work? Then I want you to prioritize your list because you're gonna use it to evaluate all the work opportunities that come your way. Then also figure out your environment, okay? Because a lot of us are built differently and you have to find a work environment that is comfortable for you, that feels natural, that allows you to perform at your highest potential. I tell you, I'm coaching a young woman right now who's working in an environment that is not a good fit. She loves her job, but the environment is so toxic that she really needs to move on. And I'm having a little bit of a difficult time getting her to see that if she doesn't change the environment, it's always going to be stressful for her because that's not my decision to make, but it's my job to help her see that. So you know, the environment matters as much as job title, as much as job responsibilities. Environment includes the people you work with, the kinds of setting that you're working in, simple things like what's your desk and office like if you have one, or will you be out and about all day long, and important big things like does this place of work hold the same values that I do, and are they expressed in the things that we do day to day? So finally, you gotta also think about what type of, type of difference that you wanna make in the world, in your field of choice. Once you figure these things out and you actually have written them down, they're gonna stick in your head and you're gonna be able to talk to people about them when you network and when you do your job search and it's gonna come across very exciting. Your, your eyes are gonna sparkle. They're gonna catch your vision because you're gonna believe it and you're gonna be seeking something that really matters to you. You know, every single one of us is so unique. We are so different that nobody can tell you the answers to those questions. You've gotta figure it out on your own. So spend time at it, think about it. You may not be able to find your ideal fit right away. A lot of times people think, oh, you know, this is an ideal, I don't know if I should take it. Well, first of all, land the position, Try it out, maybe. 
maybe you can't do paid work right away. Maybe you have to do some volunteer work. Maybe you have to take a lower level position. Maybe you have to grow towards your career. Maybe you need to get a new kind of education. I don't know. But if you keep that vision in mind, you're going to be amazed at how you were able to express your work and the value that and the desired impact that you want to have in your daily life and work, no matter what role you end up playing. And believe it or not, you can express your daily work in a variety of roles. I have probably had, if I were to count even working in Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was young, I probably had 32 different jobs. Oh boy, yeah. But in every single one of them, I've had a chance to learn something and I've had a chance to grow into how I want to make a difference. And one of the things I learned at Kentucky Fried Chicken is I didn't want to work for a boss who screamed and threw things. <laughs> and then, you know, you learn from the good ones as well as the bad. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the, um, there you go. No matter what field you're targeting, with all the changes that are going on in the workplace, every single one of us, and I don't care if you're solid in your career, if you just landed your new job, you've got to keep retooling. And it's critical that you learn certain skills and you're going to have to keep learning. We have to be able to enhance our own presence online. You have to polish your LinkedIn profile. You've got to clean up your social media accounts. You need to be able to use FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Slack. I don't know what else is out there. Those are the ones that I've been exposed to lately. There's many, many more. Get really good at online communication because your networking and your interviewing will probably be done via online tools. We were talking just before the webinar about whether you should buy a ring light. Yeah, maybe, but just make sure your lighting is good and that you test it out ahead of time. You've got to understand how to work remotely and how to still be noticed by your colleagues and peers if you end up landing a job where you're working remotely. You have to be able to manage the protocols of online meetings, even if you're generally not online, because guess what? All of us eventually will have an online meeting. And we wanna to remember to make sure we turn ourselves on mute if somebody comes in or the dog starts to bark. It's important in your job search process. And as you get to the point where you know what you wanna to do, to practice using these online skills, figure out the basics of lighting, of how to participate and follow those online protocols, how they're different than face-to-face -face meetings and how to use your um, online tools for networking and setting appointments, at least in the near future, probably that's gonna be the case. And how to work hybrid, what works for you? Um, because some of us will probably end up working hybrid. In other words, we're going to the office some and not others. Some of you are gonna be in your workplace all the time. And how are you gonna deal with some of the things that you haven't had to deal with over the past two and a half years when everybody was at home. So there's a lot of change you need to get used to. All right, let's go to the next slide. Forbes, Forbes Magazine, something I, I get um, emails from all the time because I've signed up for their, net, um, their newsletter. And I encourage you to do that because they track trends really well. And they recently published a list of essential skills that are going to be necessary in a post-pandemic world. And the ones that I have listed here are going to be in high demand, they say. So it's really good to skill up and buff yourself up for, to make sure that you're future-proofed. And if you look at them, a lot of those are sort of emotional intelligence type things as opposed to specific work skills. So now's a really good time for you to learn some things earn a certificate if you need to, sharpen your personal approach to leadership or emotional intelligence, and take some online courses because they're free or really low cost. And there's no excuse while you're still looking for work to neglect growing your skill base. Let's go to the next slide. Lastly, I think it's lastly, if I can recall, um, you wanna make sure that you plug in and that you have 
uh, a chance to uh, really build your tribe, really get yourself involved with personal connections. So you got to find some like-minded souls for the journey that you're on. And I personally missed a whole lot of interpersonal connections that were disrupted during um, the pandemic. And they're vital. You got to find your tribe. So we want to make sure that you can find people who can act like your board of directors and that will give you guidance and they'll call you on your stuff. All right. They got to be able to celebrate life with you, but they also got to be able to call you aside and say, hey, Kathy, you neglected to do what blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, I set this meeting up for you and you didn't follow through because you can easily, when you're on a job search, get lost in the internet and disconnect from people. So I want to challenge you to stretch yourself and get outside of, of the way that things have been. And as my one of my heroes used to say, commit yourself to something that's greater than your own self-interest. Because just playing with people and hanging out and having fun can be really good for you. It also can lead to other things that will help you get to where you wanna go. And it's important because connections that you find on LinkedIn or through virtual networking groups or through professional associations or volunteer opportunities or in being involved in informal community projects, you're gonna be surprised at what you uncover. And a lot of times those connections are what's gonna help you land your next best fit. I had a recent conversation with a young woman in her, oh, maybe she was in her late thirties and she had just been let go as had her husband. So it was this really stressful situation. Her husband landed his job pretty quickly, but she has a unique set of experiences in that she used to be a teacher. She moved into ministry, then she did social work and she didn't, didn't have the ability to move and she was networking. So she reached out to me because I knew her from an organization and I didn't know of anywhere that she could work, but I knew a person and I knew that she might know this person too who worked for a local not-for-profit organization. So I said, have you called Pravitra? And she said, no, but I know her well. I used to have dinner with her once in a while. I said, well, call her because she just left this job with the Chamber of Commerce. Well, Pravitra was so glad to hear from this woman, did not help her get a job with the Chamber of Commerce, but introduced her to the president of um, <laughs> another not-for-profit organization. And this young woman is now starting a job as a project manager for the other not-for-profit organization, all because we connected. So those tried and true connections that you have from your past life, you gotta remember to regenerate them, but also be open to new ones because you've got to in order to craft the future that you want for yourself. Let's go on to the next slide. And here's the last thing. It's not connecting, it's diving in. You really have to give things a try. You can think about it and think about it all you want, but follow this tinker, dabble, doodle, try theory because only by sticking your toe in the water will you know if it's a good fit. You know, and not everything's gonna have a good fit, but only if you stick your toe in the water are you going to know what there is that you liked and what there is that you didn't like about something. You might be pleasantly surprised that this whole process that we're talking about has given you a way to recreate the future that fits even better than the one that you experienced before. And I have to tell you, I mean this with all my heart. I probably have. The majority of people that I do career coaching with end up in a situation where they're happier now than they were prior to whatever happened that made them leave their job because they took some time to figure it out. 
and they were careful and they were um, really working hard at it. And, you know, they applied what they needed to do to get the job. So in the end, your resilience that I know you all have, because you've all been through some major changes, applying some of the brain science that people have been uncovering, and it's so exciting to see that it's changing a lot, and the knowledge about how you can manage change, and your own acceptance of a little bit of this discomfort that you might have as you navigate these professional pivot points, I think they're going to pay off for you in ways that you may never have imagined. Let's go on to the next slide. So, you know, we're all in this pause period together. And what I've learned through going through this with others and going through my own life transitions, many of them kind of momentous, it's that in these times of upheaval, that can be where the good stuff lives. If we use those times to better understand ourselves and our world and where we fit into it, these times of shift, of deep personal and cultural challenge, that's where our spirit, our body, our heart, and our mind can work in concert to bring us closer to our higher self or who we're meant to be. If we're aware of the transition's power and transformative potential that we have and use all of it for our own growth, what a privilege it is for us to become that which we were intended to be. That's a quote from Carl Jung. I know you've heard of him. And that's my wish for you, that you commit to use this time of deep and broad workplace transition and your own transition personally to become more of who you were intended to be. Not just for your own benefit though, but for the blessings and benefit that you're gonna bring to our new world. The world needs you. Thank you all for coming today. That's my message. And I'm really happy to stay here and answer questions if you have them. Thank you, Kathy. Sure. Uh, just before we get to a Q&A, a few things on our end. Uh, we have some upcoming events here at Cancer and Career, so you can see on the screen. Uh, there's four more webinars for this year. You can see three of them here. Our last one is um, balancing, uh, balancing work and caregiving. So if you have any caregivers in your life that you want to pass that along to, uh, you can find all of the information on our website. We also have a new series coming up that's going to all be in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking audience called Ask the Experts. Uh, it's going to be four different sessions, one with an oncologist, one with a nutritionist, one with an attorney, and one with a psychiatrist, um, talking about how their different expertise can help you out. Uh, so again, if you have any Spanish-speaking people in your life that might benefit from that, be great to pass along and then we also have our west coast conference and i use west coast kind of in quotes because it will be digital uh on zoom again just like our other conferences the past couple of years but that's going to be on saturday october 22nd uh all of these are free to register for you can go on our website right now um this deck will also be sent around if you didn't get it this morning and you can click these links directly there uh, but we hope you can join us for that. Uh, now for some Q&A. Uh, first one here we have is, what if your mind doesn't feel as sharp as it used to be and you still get tired and therefore unsure of what type of rigor you can maintain at work? So you can focus on what type of level, role you would, uh, what type or level of role to target in your job search during your transition. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a challenging question because I don't know what your background and experience and work has been. But I can tell you from my own experience and that which I've heard from others, okay? And so you can take or leave what I say. But the first thing I can say is rest and be gentle with yourself. And I say this because I forced myself to work all the way through my cancer to the point where I did kind of fall out. And what happened then is I found myself needing a lot longer to recover than I might have. 
or maybe it just would have had to have that time anyway. But I found a group of people who were leading a cancer recovery group and they taught us things like nutrition and yoga and stretching and breathing and all of those tools to enable my body and my mind to reintegrate. And I know that people have to work, but I also know that we need to be kind to ourselves and we sometimes need to rest. Speak with your medical professionals, make sure that they have you on everything that you need in order to rebuild your body. And then look at your work, test a few things, try a few things, get yourself thinking again. I know I had a hard time with numbers after a while and I would like lose things and, and um, for a while there didn't feel like I could concentrate when I was reading. So I found some other tools and I had to practice in order to get back into the work world. And I took a part-time job first before I moved on to a full-time one. That may not work for you, but the part about being kind to yourself, being gentle with yourself and taking the time to rest will work for you. So think about how you can apply that principle to your own situation. Thanks for asking that. I think there's also, you know, if you find that you're in a role that, you know, you can always ask for a reasonable accommodation or something to help get you through the role once you've gotten into it. If you realize, oh, you know, I don't have the energy to stand all day or I don't have the capacity to do X, Y, or Z because of where I am right now is also a, always an option for you. Um, the next question I have here is, what's the first step I can take to build my career connections when we're still in such an unstable time? Hmm. The first step that I would do is to look at the connections that you had prior to the pandemic and the shutdown where we were all isolating, because I don't know about you, but I lost some marvelous connections. And take a look at how you could reconnect with those people. If you're in a place where you're allowed to go out and about again and um, you know reconnect with folks, you can call them, you can set up a Zoom, or as I have done, I've reached out to some people and we scheduled a lunch. So three of us got together last week for a lunch. I hadn't seen these women in two and a half years. And oh my gosh, one is a fellow author. The other one is writing something else. And we have bonded. I know that now that we've reconnected, we could use those connections in other ways. So there's that. Who did you used to work with that you trust, that you feel good about? And also, what sorts of things go on in your community that you could start to get involved in? If you're not working yet, what sorts of things could you do that matter to you? I know where I live, there's a whole lot of environmental and climate change things happening. And so people are stepping up and being part of it. There's another group locally that's working on affordable housing because we don't have any down here in Florida. And so, you know, what, what's your passion? How can you step out in a small way and participate? And then you get to know people that way. So there's, there's a numerous ways to do it. I just think that um, you have to look inside and say, well, what interests you? And um, who did you used to know? Because guess what? They probably will be delighted to get back in touch with you too. So I think we have time for just one more question and you touched a little bit on this earlier uh but how do I determine opportunities for my career transition goal related to my old job but with a different environment or different hours or a different title so you want to have a plan for the same kind of work but in a different environment with different hours and a different title is that what I'm hearing Scott is that the question yes okay so what you're really looking at is how can you apply your skill base and your experience in an alternative setting or an alternative job title? And I always say job title doesn't matter. Environment matters and what skills you're going to use every day matter. So the people you work with, the kinds of places you work, 
the um, hours that you work, that's environmental stuff. And then the skills that you bring to the table matter. But what will be important is that you can do the translation for the new employer about what your job used to be called and how you can take those same skills and apply them in the thing that's called something else. And I see this a lot when I work with military people because you know they might've been in charge of, in fact, I just saw a military guy get hired as a manufacturing safety manager when he worked for the Marines and he was responsible for um, munitions. Well, okay, they're making pizza at this manufacturing operation, not munitions, but he sure as heck had to know about safety. So what you gotta do and what I'm trying to use with this analogy is make the translation for the employer. And a lot of times that's tough because you know that they're using these resume scanning software so you want to network your way to people and be able to talk about how you have this, this, and this skill. You've built it up over this, this, and this years of experience. And this is the impact that you've been able to have. And here's how you see how it applies in their setting to meet their need. No matter what you do, always think about what's the employer need and how do they best, how could you best solve that need, bringing the skills that you have to bear. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so I think we're out of time right now, but Kathy, thank you so much for everything. Um, we're gonna be sending around an evaluation to everybody tomorrow. It helps us, your feedback helps us design this program, know what works, what doesn't work. So we'd really appreciate if you could fill that out. Um, and if we didn't get to your question today, please feel free to give us, shoot us an email careers at cew.org. We also have a ask a career coach section on our website where you can go and ask a question and we have a team of volunteers as well as our staff will answer questions for you as well over there. It's a great resource. I think Nicole, if you can drop a link in the chat to that for anyone who's interested. Um, and again, on this slide, we have all of the CE requirements. We'll be giving the email tomorrow with the eval and the test. But um, thank you, Kathy, and thank you everybody for attending. I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you for participating and thank you for asking me to do this. Appreciate you, Scott. Um, appreciate you. Take care. Thank you.